Hey, I'm John Williams with Space Intelligence, and I'm here with famous astronaut Chris Hadfield, who's been on two space shuttle missions and has flown to space three times. And I wanted to ask him some questions. How are you doing today, Chris? And I am doing well, John. Thanks. <laughs> and can I ask you the most important question I've been wondering my whole life? What was the first thing you thought of when you felt um, zero gravity for the first time and you saw Earth from space? You know, oddly enough, John, um, the, the overriding emotion for me was relief mm -hmm. because I had been dreaming of that since I was a little kid. Yes. Uh, you know, since before I was 10 years old. And I had been making uh, choices in my life that would try and make that happen. Yes. And I had been pursuing something that seemed impossible. In fact, when I decided to turn myself into an astronaut, it was impossible. I'm Canadian. Mm -hmm. Canada didn't have astronauts. Yes. So I'd chosen a career that didn't even exist for someone yeah. with my circumstance. And so when I went through the, whatever, 26 years of preparation and training and then selection and then missions, mm -hmm. assignment, mission training, and then taking the enormous risk yes. of launching on, on fairly early in, in the, the shuttle history, about yes. halfway through, I guess it was STS-74. And the odds of dying that day were one in 38 when we now wow. look at the statistics afterwards. So willingly yeah. take an enormous risk mm -hmm. and and to fly the rocket for eight minutes and 40 seconds, the incredible physical, overwhelming power of that. But mm -hmm. at the end of it, that machine ha has taken you to the place that you were dreaming of and yes. you're there. And now, even though you've still got all the rest of the mission ahead of you and all the tasks, and mm -hmm. but now, it can never be taken away. And all of the things that I asked of my wife yes. over the decades, mm -hmm. the, the, the choices I'd made, the, you know, the, the burden that I was in my parents and, and everything else, now it, it had actually happened. And so I, I, not, I was relieved that mm -hmm. obviously I hadn't been killed that day. I was relieved that uh, now I, you know, I had my, was gonna have my gold astronaut pin. I'd flown uh, in space. But mostly I was relieved on behalf of all those people mm -hmm. uh, who had helped me get there and, and their efforts had not been in vain. Yes. So it was a wonderful feeling of gratitude and relief. That's what I felt when the engine shut off on Atlantis mm -hmm. uh, as, as we successfully got ourselves into orbit. Oh my gosh, I can't imagine that feeling. Only, only the astronauts will know, as you, as you would know. <laughs> um, now also on your I think it was on your first mission, you rendezvoused with the uh, Russian space station Mir, right? And Yeah, we helped build it, in fact, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, how was, what was it like entering that place and, you know, meeting the astronauts from another country and the whole docking experience? And overall, how was that? Well, um, in order to help build Mir, Mir is a Russian word that means the world. Yes. You know, and that's our world. It also means peace. It's one of those words that have two meanings. So it's a nice name for a, a, the greatest space station ever built up until that time. The first piece launched in 86. Um, and it, we learned a huge amount by cooperating and building the Mir space station that allowed us to build a far better international space station. Yes. Um, but it was complex because uh, it was one of the very first shuttle flights to go there. And yes. we were actually building a piece of it. So we mm -hmm. had this huge, like a big tunnel yes. in the back of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the space shuttle. And you know, had to fly our whole shuttle up with that tunnel mounted on top, like a great uh -huh. big periscope, and actually dock that tunnel into Mir, which was yes. complicated bit of flying. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, we didn't meet the mm -hmm. cosmonauts there. Obviously, we had trained with them. I traveled to Russia and Star City and and trained with them. Mm -hmm. They had come to uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Yes, uh, I'd learned to speak some rudimentary Russian at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it was more of a reunion than a meeting. Yes. Uh, but it was such a difficult threshold to get over to uh, to fly Atlantis up and find Mir and move in and do all the careful maneuvering and build this docking module with the cannon arm and then yes. fly up and get docked 
And then, wow. you know, control of the combined stack of a space shuttle and a Mir space station. We both mm-hmm. weighed about our head about the same mass. And, and finally came the moment where we had equalized pressure and we could open the hatch and mm-hmm. go inside Mir. And yeah. it was it was success, mm-hmm. you know. It, it was what all the years of work and training and, and mission development and, and all of our expertise had been trying to accomplish. And, and so we spent a few days on Mir and it was so cool to float into Mir. It was the first space station I'd ever been on. Yes. And the, the, the Soviets, the Russians, didn't have a, a space shuttle to take away the garbage out of Mir, you know, oh. the trash, the used up stuff. And so everything is sort of collected in there. Yes. It's like a cottage that where it's easy to buy a fridge and get it to your cottage, but hardly anybody ever takes a fridge all the way back from a cottage. You end up with all this junk piled up in behind because it's just yes. sort of human nature. But to float through Mir, um, your air current of you floating through Mir, all of the collected bits of things would sort of clang like wind chimes behind you <laughs> as you floated through. And it, it was amazing. It was yeah. it was an early space station. It was mm-hmm. a hey, oh here's my dog. Just it was an it was underpowered. <laughs> this is Henry. Hello. This one needed some. Um, Mir was underpowered, and yes. um, you know I learned a lot from Mir, mm-hmm. but it was uh, tremendous and and got to spend a couple days there and when we undocked we undocked from the other end of that docking module that we attached Mm -hmm. and then every shuttle that came up after that docked to that docking module so it was a really important mission Mm -hmm. but it was an amazing and almost um serene and surreal feeling to float into mirror to a to have traveled through the blackness of space, found this human yeah. habitat, this human outpost, of course. docked with it, could mm-hmm. it, and then go inside. It was it was almost like magic. It was a great feeling. That's amazing. And we're a little out on time. I was curious, could you um, tell me, what did it feel, though, when uh, your incident, when you were on a spacewalk installing the Canada Arm 2, and your spacesuit filled up with a bunch of water, and you were blinded during your spacewalk? How did you uh, deal with that stress real quick? Um, well, when you have contamination in your suit, depending on how it manifests, it, it isn't instantaneous, like everything's perfect, then everything's bad. There's some yes. transition period. In my case, this, this contaminated water got into one eye. So one eye was suddenly uh, struck with some wickedly painful contaminant in it. And you oh. know what that's like. Yes. Your eye just stops working, it starts tearing, it hurts. And and your eyes squints. Yes. But what do you do about it? Mm-hmm. You know. And in this case, I what could I do? So I, I didn't tell anybody because what could they do? It was kind yes. of up to me, and I still had one eye working. So I thought, well, I'll just keep working, and hopefully this will clear. But eventually, because tears don't fall without gravity, the tear got big enough that it flowed across my nose into my other eye, contaminated my other eye, and now suddenly. Both eyes were basically inoperative, you mm-hmm. know, trend, temporarily blind. So then I had to uh, do something about it. I had to tell mission control and we had to work the problem. But yes, like anything, I just kind of looked at it. And I went, well, every time I blink, I'm blind. I mean, oh, yeah, you're right. you don't die. Just your eyelids closed. Mm-hmm. You know, you're still blind. You just got your other four senses. And it's like... You just kind of need to look at And I had another guy out there, Scott Perezinski. He could come rescue me if I was in real trouble. And we'd practice that. And even if Scott couldn't come rescue me, I could, with the blurry sort of milky contaminant, you know, like when your yes. eyes are full of soap, you can sort of see a little bit. Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. I got myself back to the airlock. So it, I wasn't going to die. I just no. couldn't get this done. So, uh, so my real reaction was one of, like, annoyance and... Um, mm-hmm. And you want to make sure this isn't life threatening. But as soon as I realized it's this isn't life threatening, this is just mission threatening. Mm-hmm. Then it was a matter of okay, we need to solve this problem as quickly as we can so that we can get the work done out here, which is what we did. So even though it sounds cataclysmic to be struck blind during your first spacewalk, absolutely. In truth, because of training and practice and preparation, it was just an undesirable thing that happened. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. Um... I'm glad I was able to talk to you, and you have a wonderful day. Please subscribe, share our videos, and excitement about space with everyone.